Questions to the Minister of Justice, and I call Mr. John Stewart. Question number one, please, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The ministerial commitment of the time was to a wider review of the legislation governing the determination of tariffs for mandatory life sentences. In Northern Ireland, a person guilty of murder must receive a life sentence, and the sentencing judge must set an appropriate tariff. The tariff is the minimum period the person must remain in prison before being considered for release by independent parole commissioners for Northern Ireland. The tariff is determined by the judge, considering sentencing guidance, generally from judgments delivered by our Court of Appeal. Sentencing guidance is distinctly different from sentencing guidelines or a statutory structured approach for tariff setting as exists in England and Wales. The Department initiated a review of sentencing policy in 2017 and undertook a public consultation on a wide review of sentencing issues, including whether approaches to tariff setting which occur elsewhere should be developed in Northern Ireland in October 2019. The consultation closed on the 3rd of February with over 200 responses received. The responses are currently being considered. John Stewart, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I um, welcome the Minister to your position and wish her the best of luck for the years ahead. Um, I appreciate she's only one month in the post, but she will know that both her predecessors announced reviews into sentencing tariffs for murders. Does she agree with me that it's an absolute disgrace that in 2017 the average sentence for a murder in Northern Ireland was 11 years and four months, some 10 years less than the equivalent in England and Wales? When is Northern Ireland going to lose its reputation for being soft on murders? Um, I want to thank the member for his supplementary. I would just want to say a few things, if I could, in answer um, to the question. Um, first of all, I think that it is worth considering that there is no major disparity in sentencing guidance covering um, such offences and tariffs um, in between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK. Um, the tariff is the first point where someone may ask, uh, for their sentence for probation to be considered, um, but it is not um, for parole to be considered, but it is not, if you like, automatic that that person will be released from custody. It is also very difficult to do the comparative analysis, which um, the member is suggesting can't take place because very small differences um, in sentencing in Northern Ireland due to the small number of cases can skew the results. In terms of whether or not we actually need to go for a more structured sentencing approach, obviously we will be considering that in light um, of what has been uh, what has come back as a result of the consultation that we've had. However, there were significant value for money um, concerns raised in the responses when this was considered last time, and so those two things do need to be balanced. Call Paul Given. Again, uh, can I welcome the Minister to her first question time? Uh, in respect of evidence that the Chief Constable gave to the committee, he indicated uh, a concern about the lack of deterrent value in the current legislation for assaults on police officers. Uh, is that an area where the Minister uh, can look at providing additional protection uh, by way of that deterrent value? And secondly, in respect of murder, we recognise that police officers and prison officers uh, represent all of us and attack on them is an attack on democracy. Would the Minister be in favour of introducing whole life sentences so that when those individuals are murdered, life actually means life? Well, I thank um, the chair of the committee for his question. I mean, first of all, the review um, that was undertaken was tariffs for mandatory life sentences, so that has already gone ahead. Um, in terms of the issue of wider sentencing, um, there is an issue um, of, if you like, aggravated offences which need to be considered, but there are a number of different ways that people um, can be judged in terms of murder because some are whole life sent some are indeterminate, some are determinate, um, and some have tariffs applied. But if the member would like more detail, I'm happy to write to him uh, with more information in terms of how that's applied. However, I wouldn't want anyone to go away from the chamber feeling that in any way there's a huge disparity between the sentencing here in Northern Ireland and sentencing elsewhere. It has to be borne in mind that we have a very small number of such offences in any one year, and therefore to do comparative analysis compared to, for example, the much larger pool of offences that would happen in England and Wales, very small changes in Northern Ireland can produce big anomalies in terms of the comparative analysis. So I think people need to be careful about drawing that out too far. I call Doug Beatty. Um, thank you. Um, given that Westminster um, have just brought through uh, legislation to fill a gap in terrorist um, laws, um, uh, 
Can I ask the Minister, can she outline the engagement her department has had with the Northern Ireland Office uh, in respect to the terrorist offenders restriction of early release bill that saw Northern Ireland admitted from the bill? Um, yes, I can. Um, with respect to the, the provisions that have been made in Westminster um, under the emergency legislation, we had been in consultation with the Ministry for Justice and with the Northern Ireland Office. Um, we had indicated that whilst there were a number of issues in terms of how sentences are constructed in Northern Ireland and specifically with respect to any retrospectivity that might um, be incurred as a result um, of the um, changes being proposed in Westminster, there was no barrier to the legislation um, being uh, applied UK-wide. We made it clear that that would be um, our preference. Um, and indeed, in a conversation um, with the Justice Minister um, for England and Wales, uh, Robert Buckland, I made clear that that was my preference because I would be concerned that there would be any risk um, of a two-tier system of approach when it comes to the uh, paroling of uh, terrorist prisoners um, being set up within the UK. In the end of the day, that decision um, was taken by the Ministry of Justice. It is not a decision for the Department of Justice here. Um, and the decision as it was taken was to exclude Northern Ireland from that. Um, our first sight of that decision was the press release, which was issued by the Ministry of Justice in respect of that legislation. There will be other opportunities for Northern Ireland to be included in the counter-terrorism bill, which is about to come through Westminster. So it, the door, if you like, has not completely closed on that chapter. And I have written um, to the Ministry of Justice um, and to Robert Buckland to make clear that in future we would expect a higher level um, of exchange uh, of information between departments before announcements of that gravity are made. Call Emma Sheeran. Um, can I ask the Minister if she intends to review the structure of the Lord Chief Justice's sentencing group? The Lord Chief Justice's sentencing group was originally set up um, in 2016 in order to provide guideline cases that could then be considered as part of the overall consideration that judges would make um, when they were doing sentencing. Um, in addition to the, the legal members that were put onto that, um, in 2018, I think, if I'm correct, in 2018, lay members were then added to that panel as well. And at the moment, whilst we continue to review the operations of that, um, there are no firm proposals for change. Call Patsy McLone. Good morning, John Corley. I guess Moi has left you in the Fragri. Thank you, uh, Speaker. And uh, I thank the Minister for many of the, the answers have already been forthcoming. So if the Minister could bear with me and give me some latitude. Um, if I could ask just uh, if the Minister is prepared to review the sentencing for the offence of death by dangerous driving, please. Can I first of all thank um, the member for raising the issue about um, this issue because it is something which has been a major feature um, in terms of the consultation which was taken recently. Um, I'm aware, obviously, that there was particular public interest in this as a result of the accident involving Enda Dolan, um, where he died as a result um, of quite an appalling um, case. And so, first of all, can I express my sympathy to Peter Dolan and his wife, Neve, um, about the experience that they have had um, from Enda was killed in uh, 2014. I know that they have been looking as part of the sentencing review um, in terms of trying to see if there is a possibility um, of having a view on the maximum sentencing for death by dangerous driving. I shall appreciate I can't prejudge the outcome of the consultation, and so we need to look at all the responses being analysed. But I would have to say that a significant number do relate to that particular offence. And I would have to thank um, and express my thanks to the Dolan family for their efforts, which clearly highlighted the consultation and encouraged the public to get involved in that consultation and to send very detailed responses on those matters, which we're now considering. I call Jim Allister. Can I take the Minister back to... Mr. Beatty's question. Uh, is she saying to the House that there is no opportunity for her department or for the executive to themselves bring in legislation altering the parole provisions and when they kick in in respect of terrorist offences? 
With specific um, regard to terrorist offences, that is a matter um, for, UK, uh, for the UK government, as it's a reserved matter. However, with respect to parole, there is, of course, the opportunity for us um, to look at issues of parole and when those kick in with respect to those particular offences. As I actually said in answer um, to uh, Doug Beatty's question, um, the issue here is that this was driven by an imperative in um, England and Wales um, with respect to a particular issue that was arising. Um, there will be an opportunity as the MOJ bring forward UK-wide legislation to do with counter-terrorism later in the spring um, to address the wider issues which include um, the issue which the member has raised. And so it would be my hope that at that stage we will have better engagement with the MOJ, with the Department of Justice and with the NIO to ensure that we regularise what has become an anomaly now in the system. But to be clear, it is our preference um, that the UK-wide approach to this would be consistent and that a two-tier system, one administered in Northern Ireland, one administered um, in the rest of the UK, would not be, able, would not, um, be developing. I call Christopher Salford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I welcome the Minister to her place and wish her well in her new role. Would the Minister agree that whilst always wanting to be merciful and to allow people the opportunity of redemption, there are some crimes that are so despicable that life should mean life? And I think specifically around the murder of a child. I'm sure all members would agree that as part of any review of sentencing policy, anyone who engages in such a heinous act should spend the rest of their days in prison. Well, I thank the member for his point. Um, I think that there are a number of elements that um, have to be considered by judges when they're deciding on the tariff to apply in life sentence cases. But to be clear, if someone commits murder in Northern Ireland, they will automatically receive a life sentence. The question of tariff is not the point at which they are released on parole. It is the first point at which they can apply to be released on parole. So even someone who is given a life sentence with a relatively low tariff can continue to remain in prison if the parole commissioners judge that that person remains a threat to society. I call Cahill Boylan. Kesht Everdaw, let a hold question number two, please. Since the new decade, new approach deal, um, my officials have spoken to their Northern Ireland office counterparts on several occasions, and we await formal meetings to discuss the next steps towards the publication and introduction of the promised legislation. In the period following the completion of the Northern Ireland Office's public consultation on its draft storm and house agreement bill, departmental officials and relevant justice bodies participated in a series of meetings with Northern Ireland Office officials. These were intended to inform the Northern Ireland Office's thinking about how it might respond to the consultation responses and the, uh, and the implications of any proposed changes to the bill. I can assure members that my officials and I remain ready and committed to working with the UK Government and the Northern Ireland Office to progress the necessary legislation. Supplementary, Cahill Boylan. Carl Moggett, John Coyler, thank you. Mr Speaker, and could I thank the Minister uh, for her answer on which we're on the new post. But could I ask the Minister what preparations are being made by the Department to plan for the establishment of the HIU? Carl Moggett. Well, it's clear, um, based on the earlier draft legislation, which had been um, published by the Northern Ireland Office, that many of the areas that are going to be included in that legislation don't fall within my responsibilities. However, the recent commitment did include recognition that the legislation should have the consent of the Northern Ireland Assembly, um, and so there will have to be work done in order to achieve that before we go any further. It's unclear as to whether that will be via a legislative consent motion, because, as the member rightly um, rightly indicates um, this is a matter um, of some urgency. Even um, accepting that, um, there are issues that we can do in um, preparation, and so there has been a team, a specialist team, uh, put in place in order to scope out the work needed for the HIU. But I would have to say to all members that whilst we are working on this um, as a department, Unless the UK government is also, as well as legislation, providing funding, it will be incredibly difficult for us to be able to deliver a scheme that can actually deliver for victims of the troubles. I call Paul Frew. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And given the Minister mentioned funding and the NIO, she well know that the various rests with the Secretary of State uh, about the decision around separated prisoners within our prison system. Would the Minister agree with me that the burden of finance should be placed at the NIO, shadowy as they may be, 
to actually pay for separation of our prison service, allowing that money to go into frontline services within our prisons? Well, Mr Speaker, we've gone some way, I think, from the HIU and the Stormont House Agreement um, to the separated regime in prisons. But in principle, I'm always happy for somebody else to pick up the bill um, for issues that we have to take care of in the department. And so if the NIO are willing um, to, to do so, I would be more than happy to let them. But I think realistically, at this point in time, um, we are working hard and we recognise the sensitivity. Um, of the separated regime that we have in the prisons. We are working hard with our colleagues in prison service to make sure that that is stable, um, to make sure that the numbers, as far as is within our gift, can be reduced, and also that those who are on the separated regime um, are not, if you like, following a significantly different regime to the rest of those who are in the prison system. And I think that that's hugely important. I call John Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does the Minister concede that any investigation body, such as the HIU investigating the past, cannot be both investigator and adjudicator? Well, I think in terms of needing to be Article 2 compliant, it is important that the person who, that the body which investigates would then produce reports which would be forwarded um, to a separate body to determine whether or not. Um, any prosecutions would take place, and I'm not sure if that is the particular issue uh, which the member is hinting at, but certainly from our perspective, um, that would be the separation that we would see in this, but it is entirely appropriate that those who do the investigation produce the reports. I call Joanne Bondi. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, just going back to the original question, can I ask the Minister what liaison she or her department has had with the NIO with regard to the responses to the most recent legacy consultation uh, and what, in her view, must happen as a result of the concerns raised by innocent victims? Well, the issue, um, as you will be well aware, um, is one that has drawn some particular political controversy over many, many years. Um, and I suspect that that may not change in the near future. However, it is a matter for the NIO who took forward the consultation um, to look and assess uh, the responses. From our perspective, we are very clear that the current regime, um, in terms of being able to deal um, with historic cases, is, is not fit for purpose and cannot continue indefinitely. We recognise that the implications of continuing to police the past um, and to investigate the past out of current budgets is a deflection from the work of the present, and yet it is an important piece of work that needs to be done because it will otherwise colour people's interactions with the, ju the, the justice system in the present. And so whilst the, there may be many concerns about the Stormont House Agreement, there may be concerns about the HIU, as we stand here today, there is no alternative proposal that has received any more um, by way of support than the Stormont House Agreement. And so I think that we have a duty um, to try to take this forward in a way that allows the police, the judiciary, the police ombudsman and all of the others involved to move forward and focus on policing the present and the future um, and allow the past to be dealt with through a comprehensive mechanism. And I believe that Stormont House, whilst imperfect, is the best opportunity that we have to do that. And I call Colin McGrath. Mr Speaker, and I welcome the Minister to her first question time in Wish Oil. Um, does the Minister agree that the establishment of the HIU is the last chance for many victims and survivors to obtain truth and justice for their loved ones, and that all those responsible for their deaths should be held to account regardless of who they are? I do. I believe that it is hugely important, as I say, in order to transform our society from one where there have been significant issues around lawlessness and lack of respect um, for the rule of law. I think it is hugely important that in order to build confidence that we are going forward on a different basis, that we address those issues and that we give victims the opportunity not just to receive truth, but also where possible to receive justice. I think we also have to be realistic that with the passage of time, um, not only is there an issue about how likely those cases will be fit to be prosecuted, but also there is an ongoing issue of people who have died without having received justice and have carried that burden to their grave themselves. I think that we have a duty as a society to deal with those who are victims and who were most acutely affected by the troubles, but that duty goes beyond just those who were victims and survivors. It also extends to wider society in terms of setting what are the standards, and I think we have to look at what is happening in other places. For example, historical sex offences are being prosecuted. Um, 
and that is right that it should be so and I don't think there would be a single person in this chamber that would argue that the age of the offender um, or the, the, the remoteness of the incident um, should excuse proper investigation and prosecution where possible and therefore I believe that it should be no less serious when it comes to murder. Well, Philip McGuigan. The Executive Office has policy, statutory and budgetary responsibility for the establishment of the Redress Board and has been leading engagement with victims and survivors groups. However, my department is working diligently to establish the Redress Board and to support Justice Colton to discharge his functions as President-elect of that board. The President-elect has met with the victim uh, with the interim advocate, appointed to act as the voice of victims and survivors of historical institutional abuse and to ensure that their needs are both known and communicated, pending the appointment of a Commissioner for Survivors of Institutional Childhood Abuse on a number of occasions to discuss the remit of that board. He also met with representatives of each of the victims and survivors groups on the 18th of December 2019 to discuss a number of issues, including the board's intended approach to the payment of compensation. Redress board officials are in regular contact with the Interim Advocates Office, and a very helpful meeting with victims groups to discuss the content of the application form took place on the 21st of January. A further three meetings based on agendas proposed by the interim advocate are scheduled to take place this month to help inform the board's emerging procedures and guidance. The president-elect is content that any issues raised by the groups about the redress board's emerging procedures should be shared with the redress board officials via the interim advocate's office. Redress board officials will continue to engage with the groups through the interim advocate to ensure that the redress scheme meets their needs. Phil McGuigan, supplementary. Graham Elgott, uh, Ken Collier. And can I just, uh, like others have done, welcome the Minister to her first question time, congratulate her on her job and wish her well, uh, and thank her for her fulsome answer to the question, and she did in the answer mention the application form. Can I just ask for clarification if the, the, the groups will get sight of the application form before it's published? Well, I believe that there, as I think I mentioned that three further meetings um, are being brought forward um, by the end of February. I'm not clear as to whether or not the application form itself will be the subject of discussion at those meetings, but I can certainly check and revert to the member in writing um, to confirm with him one way or the other. I call Gordon Dunn. I too uh, thank the Minister for her response and welcome her to her new post. Excuse me, following the head of the civil service David Sterling's letter uh, to six institutions in late 2019, which stated institutions had an obligation to contribute to payments for victims. Can the minister outline what discussion she has had with executive colleagues regarding the, con the contribution from such institutions towards the compensation for victims of HIU? Well, as I said at the outset, um, it is essentially the Executive Office that has the policy, statutory and budgetary responsibility for the establishment of the Redress Board. And so I think that that question would be best um, placed with the Executive Office and the First and Deputy First Minister. Called Rosemary Barton. Thank you. Can the Minister confirm there will be no delay in compensation payments and the first payments will be made by the end of March? With respect to the timing um, of the payments, my understanding um, is that um, it will be done by yes, the end of the end of April. So the application forms themselves, um, they'll be open to receive applications by the end of March. Um, applicants will then be dealt with as swiftly as they can be, um, but that will depend obviously on the volume and the complexity of the applications that are received. Um, in deciding the priority order of applications to be processed, um, they will obviously have due regard to the age and the health of the applicant. They will be able to make an applicant by submitting um, a, an online application form or a paper application form, and it is anticipated um, that the first payments um, that the panel will sit to determine the first payments from the 20th of April, and the first payments will be made in early May. Call John Blair. <laughs> Speaker, thank you, and, and I also, like previous speakers, would like to take this opportunity to welcome the Minister, my colleague, to, to her post and wish her well for the, 
for the future. Can I ask for a clarification uh, from the Minister, uh, Mr Speaker, in relation to whether those who have already given evidence to the Heart Inquiry will also be required to give evidence again to the Redress Board? Um, that it will not be the case. Applicants who give um, evidence to the Heart Inquiry won't be required to provide further written evidence to the Redress Board unless they wish personally to do so. They will be asked if they're content for the Redress Board to determine their application based on the evidence of the Heart Inquiry, and the Redress Board will then obtain a copy of that from the Public Records Office Northern Ireland on the applicant's behalf. Call uh, Mr David Hildich. Um, I could, if I could ask for the Speaker's indulgence, there are quite a lot of statistics in this answer um, and I don't want to stumble over them, so I might take slightly longer um, than I would like. Figures from the Police Service for Northern Ireland record that there were 5,290 offences of rape, including attempted rape, reported to the police during the period 2014 to 2019. Of these, a charge or summons has been the outcome in 385 cases. Please note that the number of offences resulting in charge or summons is only provisional. Investigations for rape offences recorded since 2014 will be ongoing and may result in a charge or summons at a future date. Similarly, numbers of offences reported since April 2019, included in the total of 5,290, are provisional. Figures from the Public Prosecution Service record that for the period 2015-16 to 2018-19, there were 1,941 files received that included an offence of rape or attempted rape. During that period, a total of 258 prosecution or diversion decisions were issued by the Public Prosecution Service for cases that included an offence of rape or attempted rape. In relation to cases dealt with at courts in the period 2014 to 2018, which included at least one count of a substantive or attempted rape offence, there were 345 prosecutions, resulting in convictions in 81 cases. David Hilly, supplementary. Thank you, and uh, welcome the Minister to her first question time. Uh, there's a lot of concern and, about the process and figures out there, and the up-to-date figures which you just received. Uh, what steps are being taken uh, to increase the, the low conviction rate and how will the department support victims going through the process, which doesn't appear to maybe be happening now? Well, I think that that is a, a key issue and clearly one um, that is hugely important. The Gillen Review um, obviously was commissioned by the Criminal Justice Board to examine how the criminal justice system deals with cases of serious sexual assault. Sir John Gillen has made 253 recommendations for improving procedures and practice to deliver better outcomes and support for complainants. I'm committed to delivering real change in the experience of complainants and welcome the commitment that has also been shown by Justice Partners to work together with my department to ensure coordinated reform. Sir John's comprehensive review presents an opportunity, I think, to focus our efforts on delivering a justice system that complainants have confidence in. We want to prioritise those areas which can have the greatest impact on complainants going through that system in the first phase of implementation. Recommendations to be taken forward as a priority in the first phase include the appointment of additional case progression officers in the PPS and PSNI, establishing new remote evidence centre in Belfast um, to allow vulnerable complainants to give evidence without having to appear in court, providing complainants with legal advice and representation pre-trial to ensure complainants are better supported and have a voice from the outset, consideration of how best to take forward pilot pre-recorded cross-examination next year where victims give their evidence ahead of trial and reform of the committal process later this year so the complainants only have to give oral evidence once in court. So also, we are intending to do scoping work in relation to providing additional support to young victims and witnesses, um, including consideration of the child house model in a Northern Ireland context. A dedicated implementation team has been established in the Department of Justice to coordinate those phased actions as agreed by the Criminal Justice Board. Linda Dillon for a very quick question and a super answer. Uh, my question actually has been partly answered and I want to wish the Minister well in, in her post and I'm sure I'll be working very closely with her in terms of my role as, as Deputy Chair. You've outlined obviously that uh, the Gillen recommendations you, you know you're working towards or your department is working towards addressing some of those. Do you think that the gaps are more in the process 
or in the legislation? In, in other words, do we, uh, is there further legislation we need or is the process going to be enough in order to deal with the, the outstanding issues? <coughs> I think that it covers three real sets of, of areas. There's, first of all, I think an educational piece where we actually need, I think, not just the Department of Justice, but also other departments to engage in educating people better about the issues of consent um, and uh, sexual assault. Um, I think we also then need to look at process issues that can be resolved without legislation. And the third category does include legislation. And I would hope um, that in the miscellaneous provisions bill that we're hoping to bring forward next year in the Department of Justice, we'll be able to take through the first wave um, of change from the Gillen Review um, in terms of legislative change. But obviously, the committal reform bill um, that I have said will be brought forward this spring will deal with at least one of those issues in terms of replication um, and expecting somebody to repeat their evidence more than once in court. We now move to topical questions and I call Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I too would like to welcome the Minister to your place. Last week, the Chief Constable appeared before the Justice Committee and failed to give the police assessment of the current status of the provisional IRA. Is the Justice Minister with responsibility for policing matters able to give her assessment to the House? The assessment um, of the activity of the provisional IRA is not a matter um, for the Department for Justice. Um, the assessment of active terrorism is a matter for the Northern Ireland Office um, and an operational matter for the Chief Constable, and therefore it isn't something that I can offer. John Buckley, supplementary. Does the Minister recognise the damage to public confidence in our, or in our justice system that this lack of evidence results in? by a Chief Constable ducking the question, a Justice Minister dodging the question, and an independent commission, commission which has run away from the question. The people of Northern Ireland, and indeed in light of recent activities in the Republic of Ireland, are quite rightly asking the question. Legitimately, where does this responsibility lie? We have the right for an answer, or is it a case that dark forces continue to operate with, with no um, accountability from our judiciary? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, for fear of any confusion, I didn't dodge the question. In fact, I gave the member a very clear answer. Responsibility for this matter lies with the Northern Ireland Office. I call Jerry Carl. Uh, thanks, Mr Speaker. Can the Minister indicate whether she supports the campaign of the families of the Spring Hill and the West Rock massacre, uh, which took place in my constituency in July 1972? And in particular, uh, will she, in her new role as Justice Minister, publicly support the family's demand for an inquest hearing into the deaths of their loved ones? Well, I thank the member um, for his question. As you're aware, there is already a procedure in place um, when issues are referred to the coroner for an inquest decision. However, I believe that the best way forward in terms of dealing with legacy issues is, as I have stated um, in the earlier part of my answers, is a comprehensive process such as that set out in the Stormont House Agreement. Um, but I'm happy to meet um, with the member and with his constituents if it would be helpful to discuss it further with them. Jerry Carl, supplementary. Uh, I thank you, Minister, for your uh, answer, and I think um, I can't speak on behalf of all the families, but I would imagine they, they would be willing to meet with you, and uh, I would like to thank you for that offer. Obviously, five people uh, massacred, shot down in cold blood, three of whom, which were teenagers, is a, an absolute crime, and those families deserve uh, truth and justice. So I will certainly pass that message on to the families, and I thank her for her answer today. Okay, I call John Dallet. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, a topical issue at the moment is homelessness, and the Minister for Justice may well wonder why on earth she's been asked a question on that subject. The Minister, I don't know if she's been to McGilligan Prison yet or not. If she has, she will have discovered that hundreds of prisoners are living in accommodation over 80 years old, nesting huts built during the Second World War. Is the Minister aware of this and what are her plans to address it? Well, I thank the member um, for um, his question. With respect to McGilligan, 
The Department is committed um, to replacing um, the prison at McGilligan and retaining a prison at that site. We recognise that there is significant investment required on the site um, and as part of the work um, of the prison service and the, the directorate um, for prisons, they are taking forward a number of proposals uh, which are required in terms of the prison's estate and I would be happy um, to inform the, the member um, of the detail um, of what is proposed. But we are aware of McGilligan and I will indeed, I haven't visited yet, but I will indeed be visiting in the, in the next few weeks. John Dallas, supplementary. Well, Mr Speaker, when the Minister is visiting, perhaps he can slip me into the Skoda limousine and I'll be happy to join her. <laughs> How uh, does he get a release date, John, just to ensure you get I that? I join with the Minister in, in, in supporting the retention of McGilligan uh, Prison, where it is. It, not only does it provide employment to a lot of people, but the local community have embraced it, particularly the uh, open part of the prison and I can speak in glowing terms about it and that's why I've raised the question. Mr Speaker, can the Minister give us a time scale for when these 80 year old Nissan huts will disappear? Well, I don't think it would be appropriate for me um, to, um, to prejudge the outcome of the development of the estates. But as you know, in December 2018, the Northern Ireland Prison Service published a document in terms of the estates um, and actually sought the view of stakeholders. We remain committed um, to the redevelopment of McGilligan Prison and an outline business case is, very, is an advanced stage for that and will be submitted for approval in the coming months. So I can assure him that we are not dragging our heels on the issue. I call Karen Mullen. I would also like to wish the Minister well in her new role. Minister, you will be well aware of the commitment given in the 2013 TBOX strategy to create a 10-year programme to reduce and remove by 2023 all interface barriers. Can the Minister give us an update? The Department has been taking forward work um, on a collaborative basis with other departments. Um, around trying to support communities um, in the removal of interface barriers. Some of those communities, as you will appreciate, um, face significant challenges um, in terms of building the confidence that would allow them to feel safe and secure. And that has to be our priority, that people feel safe in those communities when barriers are removed. There are a number of areas where there have been successful um, programmes introduced already. And I think there are three more um, due for consideration this spring. Our responsibility in the Department of Justice is to move at the pace that is demanded by the residents in the neighbourhood. We can't move ahead of them because without their support it will not be successful and could actually be counterproductive. Equally, we should not be behind them um, in when they ask for our support and ask for change to be made. And so my role is to support them fully in what they need to do. And I know that our officials engage with people um, in interface communities, looking at how those structures can be reduced, can be amended um, and can eventually be removed. Because I think we would all agree that what we would like is a community that is free from barriers, both physical and mental in terms of how people can actually live their lives um, and do so in a way that doesn't curb their aspirations um, and their freedom to make their own choices. Carolyn Mullen, supplementary. I'd like to thank the Minister for her answer and her understanding of, of the issues that's there. Um, to progress this, the creation of an interface buyer support package was identified as a key action. An aftercare a uh, support package was presented to the Interfaces Programme Board in June 2019. As of February 2020, it appears that it has still not been signed off and uh, no delivery schedule is yet available. Can the Minister comment on why this package is still not available to local communities impacted and when it is likely to be in place? Well, I can't give a definitive answer, but I'm going to guess that part of the reason it hasn't been signed off is because we haven't had a minister um, in place to be able to do that. Um, but it, I will certainly talk to the department um, and see what stage that is at and see whether there is anything more that we can do to advance it. I think it's absolutely crucial that we support communities, not just as they prepare to remove barriers, but that we also make sure that adequate support is in place afterwards. Because even low-level um, 
antisocial behaviour in an area where there has previously been an interface structure can cause real fear in a community that they think that things are going to escalate um, and become much more serious. And so it's important that we have early warning systems in place and that we have good support in terms of neighbourhood policing, community contact um, and a package of measures that will make sure that people actually feel that they are safer without the structure there than they are with the structure in place. And that is ultimately our, our objective. I call Sinead Ennis. Um, <clears throat> Minister, the Department of Justice consulted last year on measures to combat, uh, combat child sexual exploitation. Among Sinn Féin's recommendations were to create a new criminal offence of upskirting. Can the Minister of Justice indicate how soon she intends to bring forward legislation to create this new criminal offence of upskirting? Thank you. Um, as you will be aware, there are a number of things in process um, in respect of sexual offences, not least of all the issue um, of the Gillen Review. But there is also an issue around cyber crime um, and looking at how cyber crime and attacks can be done. There's a white paper in Westminster. So we will be considering um, which is the most appropriate vehicle for us to be able to deal with that particular issue um, so that we ensure that people are protected. There is no doubt that things like upskirting, revenge, porn, um, and a whole series of other online abuses are serious matters, um, a serious invasion of privacy and a serious violation of people's bodily autonomy. It's something that we need to deal with, and I think even in terms of a piece of education work, such as that suggested in the Gillen Review, it's important that people understand the seriousness of those incidents. I think, though, because the... Because... Um, Digital crime remains a reserved matter. We may need to look carefully at whether or not the Assembly is able to progress that or whether it is better that we ask Westminster to do so on our behalf. Uh, thank you, Minister. Sinn Féin also recommended reversing the, the burden of proof uh, from child victims uh, to the defendant for some sexual offences. Does the Minister intend to legislate for this change? I have no plans to legislate um, for the change at this point in time. However, I would have to say that there are a number of things that we are doing to support child victims, including, for example, making sure that they're able to give evidence remotely in cases so that they're not at risk of coming into contact with the offender, um, ensuring that they are properly supported in advance of that in an age-appropriate way. Um, and there are a number of other things that we can do in terms of ensuring that victims are properly cared for. So I think that there are a number of packages and measures in place um, that we can do to support them, but there are no plans at this stage for legislation. However, I did mention in an earlier um, answer that there is an intention um, in the latter half of this mandate to bring forward um, a miscellaneous provisions bill in justice. Um, I know that those can be burdensome at times for the committee, and so I apologise in advance because they tend to, co to cover quite a wide range of issues, but there is the opportunity if the member wants to discuss further with me her concerns that it may be something that will be able to be scoped and taken forward at that time. Call Meg Nesbitt. Uh, the Minister may be aware that the parents of Paul Quinn were in Parliament buildings today to express their disgust that the Finance Minister, Conor Murphy, has failed to withdraw his unjust claim of criminality against Paul Quinn. Uh, does the Minister, as Justice Minister, agree and support Mr and Mrs Quinn's call uh, for the Justice Minister to withdraw the claim? Well, I thank the member for his question. Each of us as ministers take a ministerial pledge which commits us to working collectively to achieving a society free of paramilitarism and to challenge paramilitary activity and associated criminality. All of us need to live up to those commitments. Anyone with information in respect to Paul Quinn's murder should pass that to the police. Any attack by any group on any member of our community is completely unacceptable and is to be condemned. And I have a huge amount of sympathy for the Quinn family. I think Breege and Stephen Quinn have acted with integrity throughout this process, not only in terms of trying to seek justice for their son, but also in trying to ensure that the smear against his name is removed. And I believe that it is right that it should be, um, and that there, the insult which was added to the injury of his loss should be removed. An apology cannot make up for the damage that has been done, but it would go a long way to show um, an understanding of the impact that that, that, that has had. Mike Nesta, supplementary. Does the Minister agree that the, the Finance Minister's failure to withdraw this unproven claim of criminality undermines the credibility and integrity of an executive which places a huge emphasis on collective responsibility? 
Well, I can't answer for the finance minister, but I was in my place um, when the deputy first minister was in her place answering this question and said that the allegation had been withdrawn. So I would really have to point um, the member to that answer. The allegation has been withdrawn, not as he suggests, refused to be. I call John Blair and we have a minute and a half left. Mr Speaker, thank you. And I, I can assure you I'll try to stick to that. Uh, Mr Speaker, my, my constituent, Fiona Jameson, has been in the news recently regarding stalking and the pressing need for legislation around that. Could the Minister outline her plans in this regard? Thank you. Um, yes, I met with uh, Fiona Jemison um, and her daughter, um, Kira Hyman, who has been a victim of stalking, and her mother has been an incredible advocate for her. I have met with a number of victims of stalking over the last number of weeks, and members will be aware that it is my intention to introduce a bill um, to create a specific offence of stalking in the autumn. It is also the intention of that bill um, to create uh, stalking protection orders, as we are aware that the burden um, to under harassment legislation and so on requires the victim um, to go to court to get a non-molestation order, and that can often be appealed and allows those who wish um, maliciously to use the justice system to continue contact, unwanted contact with their victim, and um, to do so. The, uh, the stalking protection orders would mean that those are taken by the police and therefore would relieve the victim of stalking of both the burden financially um, and also the burden of going to court in order to achieve one. Members, the time is up and I would ask members to take a raise for a moment or two, just please.